Hi, if you're interested in oriental rugs and other textiles and the cultures that made them past and present, RugTube is the place for you. We welcome collectors, dealers, aficionados, and maybe even scholars to talk about what's new, what's old, ideas, theories, and maybe even a bit of speculation here and there. We at RugTube know real art is the kind you can walk on. This evening, I'd like to tackle the enormous subject of the sweep of German rug scholarship from the late 19th century to the middle of the 20th century. This is an enormous span of time, and I'm going to have to be somewhat selective, perhaps considerably selective in the mid 20th century. But I hope to hit on some major themes that art historians, particularly in German speaking lands, not only in Germany, but also particularly Vienna, this was a hotbed for art history, for art theory, and for studies in Islamic art. The reason is not hard to fathom because the German-speaking lands were quite close to the Near East, particularly Turkey. I'm going to discuss a little bit why Turkish rugs have not received their due. But before I do that, I'd like to discuss thematically some early scholarship. A good example is presented by Alois Riegel, who lived from 1858 to 1905. He is considered a pivotal member of the Vienna School of Art History, and in some ways he established the academic study of art history not only in Germany, but worldwide. In 1886, he accepted a curatorial position at the Museum for Angewandete Kunst in Vienna, where he would work for the next 10 years, eventually as director of the textile department with the famed imperial collection of rugs that is so known and loved today. He later took a post at the University of Vienna. His first book, Antique Oriental Carpets, published in 1891, was a milestone, but in many ways his second book, Problems of Style, Foundations for a History of Ornament, 1893, was even more groundbreaking. He developed an all-embracing history of ornament. For example, he traced the arabesque, which is the split-leaf design, from the ancient Near East, from well before the pre-Islamic period, through the classical world, through Islamic art, and into the medieval period to the present. His theories about the relationship between cultural history and design are still debated today. According to him, art did not imitate reality, but was an expression of desired reality. Here is an example of his work. It is monumental, and sadly, this publication dating to 1895 has very limited illustrative material. What it does have, and this is a good example, are line drawings that outline some ancient, particularly Sasanian, vessels and other objects that can be used to date rugs art historically. It's important to realize that at this time, nobody was sure about what rugs should date. If you're encountering a modern rug, you can surmise it's modern, but if it's 100 years old, 200 years old, 300 years old, what can you compare it to? It's a problem because there's no direct one-to-one -one correlation between rugs and other art forms. And this is a problem that the early art historians had to deal with. Now, today, with C14, it's less of a problem. But in the late 19th century, art historians used methods of argument to propose a chronological framework that their art could fit in. 
This moves naturally to Wilhelm von Bode, 1845 to 1929. He was ennobled in 1913. It gives you some example of the status he held in the museum community. He was the creator and first curator of what is now known as the Bode Museum. He greatly influenced American collectors, J.P. Morgan, Henry Clay Frick, and others. In the 1890s, Berlin was far behind Munich and Dresden in its art collections, but with the enthusiastic participation of Wilhelm von Bode, there was a shift from these other centers to Berlin, which seemed natural because, of course, Berlin was the capital of United Germany. Bode's writings were on a variety of topics in art history, particularly Italian Renaissance art. This, this fits in very naturally with the study of rugs, because, of course, Italian Renaissance paintings are an important source material for the earliest rugs. Many of his texts remain important even today. Here is an example. It's less monumental in its format, but sadly, the illustrations leave much to be desired. It is a problem that art historians had to deal with, and they developed a particular style of describing what was in the black and white photograph. This is a style that is still used by some of the earliest art historians uh, and some modern art historians today. It's something of a space filler, but in an era before reliable color photography, this is what had to be done. It severely hindered the appreciation of carpets. It meant that in order to appreciate carpets, you had to be right on top of them. You had to have the earliest carpets in front of you. You couldn't study photographs. This leads naturally to a consideration of the absolutely monumental Friedrich Sara and Hermann Trenkwald. The book Old Oriental Carpets was so important that it was translated from German into English. It is so enormous that it is difficult for one person to hold. One of the reasons it is so difficult for one person to hold is the size. The next reason are the illustrations. There are a range of not only black and white, but color illustrations. This monumental volume in many ways is still of critical importance for coming to grips with the Imperial Viennese collection. Also, at the same time, there was a move away from purely hypothetical or theoretical consideration of rugs in relation to other arts. This very important leap is particularly known from the writings of Kurt Erdmann. His books are still regarded as essential reading even today. He lived from 1901 to 1964. He specialized in Sasanian and Islamic art. The Sasanian period is particularly known from ancient Iran, and it is the period immediately before the Arab conquest. Perhaps he is even better known for his work on rugs. He established it as a subspecialty of Islamic art. He was one of the protagonists of the Berlin School of Islamic Art History. The Berlin School was a marked departure from the Vienna School. Briefly, the Berlin School relied upon 
Renaissance period paintings to establish a terminus antiquem, the latest possible date that a rug could have been made. This means that if a rug appeared on an Italian Renaissance painting that could be securely dated to a particular range, the assumption would be that the rug would have been old, maybe several years, several decades, by the time it was painted. So that this type of rug couldn't be said to be much later. It could be a bit earlier, but it establishes an important theoretical time frame before the use of absolute dating, like C14, which in many ways revolutionized art history. Erdmann was on an apprenticeship at the State Museum in Berlin when he was invited by Sarah and Trenkwald to collaborate on their absolutely enormous publication. This event led him to concentrate upon rugs. In fact, even today it is rare for art historians or Islamic art historians to concentrate on rugs. The reasoning is not hard to fathom. Rugs are a commercial product today. The earliest rugs, because they're susceptible to moth and, and water damage and rot, are not so many. There are a few repositories of early rugs. The result is many people today might say everything has already been discovered. There's nothing new. However, in the 20th century, particularly the early 20th century, the rug field was burgeoning with enthusiasm. It was an incredible new field for everyone. From 1958 to 1964, Erdmann was head of the Museum of Islamic Art in Berlin. He was responsible for the reconstruction of the Berlin Museum collections after the Second World War. He was the first to describe the four social layers of carpet production. These four layers were nomadic, village, town, and court manufacture. He recognized the traditions of village and nomad carpet designs as a distinct artistic tradition on their own, not just a degeneration from court manufacture. Until he published his studies, art historians were influenced by the 19th century Vienna School that particularly focused on degeneration. This not surprisingly held that Persian art and Persian rugs hold the first place in the study of carpets. Ertmann thought differently. He also established the structural analysis as a means to determine the historical framework of rug weaving traditions in the Islamic world. Structural analysis means things like how the yarn is put together and how the yarn is tied, how it's tufted. He investigated the replacement of floral and foliate or ornaments by geometrical designs and the substitution of earlier infinite repeat by large centered compositions of ornaments. He found that there was a particular period in the 15th and 16th centuries where patterns underwent a very rapid change. And he's particularly known and loved by scholars of Turkish carpets his history of the early Turkish carpet was translated by Robert Pinner and it was published by Ogu's Press in London. He very much adds to the clarity of that work. However, if I can read a bit from this book, specifically about Anatolian rugs. When talking about Turkish carpets, and in particular Konya carpets, which are some of the earliest examples of Turkish carpets to survive, Ertman says, The famous Venetian traveler Marco Polo, 
who was in Asia Minor in 1271, wrote, There are three classes of people in Turkomania. The first are the Turkomans. They live in the mountains and the valleys where there is good grazing for their herds. The other two classes are the Armenians and the Greeks who, with the Turkomans, live in towns and villages and are occupied with trade and handicrafts. The best and most beautiful carpets in the world are made there. Clearly he's extolling non-court manufactories and particularly non-Persian rugs. He's giving Anatolian rugs a, a pride of place. And again, as Ertman says, Marco Polo had just returned from Persia when he made this statement. In his opinion, the Turkish carpet of the 13th century was superior to the Persian of the same period. And this had been supported by others. Ibn Said, in about 1274, wrote, In Aksaray are made the Turkmen carpets which are exported to all of the countries of the world. And Ibn Battuta, who traveled in Anatolia at the beginning of the 14th century, also praised them and maintained that they were being exported to Egypt, Syria, Iran, Persia, India, and China. Anatolian products of the 13th century, obviously exported in great numbers, have been found in Egypt as the fragments from Old Cairo prove. Clearly, at this early date, at the time Marco Polo was traveling through Asia, Persian carpets did not hold pride of place. And in fact, this is a significant observation, and it's something that should be taken seriously. It seems as if many art historians, following from a late 19th century viewpoint, held that Persian art should be number one. Persian art was the ideal form that everything else derived from. In fact, there are many other sources of designs. And when considering rugs, there are enormous numbers of different nomad groups scattered throughout the Near East that can lay very valid claims for not only unique designs, or at least designs specific to them, but also very technically proficient rugs. Thank you very much for your time.